Okay, everybody, this, we're going to talk about quantum. Quantum is the new technology that we're actually starting to pursue. We actually were doing, to let you guys know, we formed a little hidden away quantum group about a year ago. Uh, we decided that it was the technology we wanted to progress with, and we said we need to start working with this at the Air Force level. And so we got together, and uh, uh, this was after we had taken as a CTO, we took trips to uh, California and talked to D-Wave a couple times. And we talked to uh, Google and we talked to several other people about what we were doing. And so we said, we will get together and figure out how we're going to progress going down a quantum path in a way that we can actually make sense of it. So we basically, and this is history behind it, but let's, let's talk about something else first. We basically were working with, uh, we were at AFRL, we worked with, uh, Air Force University, AFIT, the Academy, and we decided to get together and say, what could we actually do in terms of quantum as we progress? Now, this is just a, this is just a couple of slides on refresher because of terminology issues that we get into immediately when we start talking about quantum. Uh, the history behind quantum is basically that, and my deputy used to be a, a, a uh, quantum chemist, and she used to correct me all the time, <laughs> so I make a mistake, don't worry about it. I'm used to being corrected by my quantum chemist. And she still works for me, but not as my, but, but not as my deputy. So I still talk to her a lot. <laughs> um, basically, classic physics is a Newtonian model, and Maxwell's law of electromagnetics. And they found there were three, three use cases where they couldn't use these to actually explain an effect. And basically, the effect was, uh, it was a, first one was a black box, was it could emit an infinite amount of energy when it was absorbed at all frequencies, however it didn't work that way. Also the next one was the, the number of electrons and energy emitted when ultraviolet light is shown on a metal surface was dependent upon the intensity of the light, that didn't work either. And the last was classical engineering theory cannot explain the optical emission. These three caused the issue to occur that they had to figure out another method of doing things. And that's where it came out to be uh, that basically light behaves both as a particle and as a wave. Now, if you go to everyone to classical physics or physics, new, you find that this is the prevailing theory across the world, that light is both a wave and, a, and that's what they teach. But they never teach the background of how they got to that and how they got to the quantum piece of it. Oops, let's try this. This is this. Okay, the quantum term superposition is basically two different states exist at the same time. This is, this is how quantum basically work. It says that it can be in every state at the same time. And that's some of the basis for some of the computing processing that we have right now is they believe that what happens is I can see every possible combination of a particular optimization at one point in time, <clears throat> and then I have to download those results out. Same with entanglement and qubits. Qubits is the quantity measure. And there's particles and the quantum information. And this, basically the theory is that I can see, if I push something through a quantum, I can see both, all states that possible at why it's working. And we'll go back to this one again for a second. I don't wanna give you a classical theory class here, but. Okay. The real, the real issue is the optimization piece. What we get out of it is classical computers work in a binary manner. Quantum computers are not limited to two choices. Quantum has every possible combination at the same time. And so this supports instantaneous optimization problems. And that's where most of the research has been. And obviously some of the, the problem spaces has been in decryption. This is the concern that we, everybody's had already because decryption is a factoring problem. So if I can know all possible combinations instantaneously for my factoring, I can break encryption codes. And this is where it's first started off, is why we have to go to quantum, because if we don't go to quantum, the enemy is gonna go there and, and decrypt everything we've had for the last 25 years. Now, having said that, the idea is what other quantum encryption algorithms can we also build that will be quantum? decrypt and proof. <laughs> and so we'll get into that, some of the theories behind that. 
Also, we were stuck with an environment where the uh, microprocessors are reaching their maximum limitations right now. You know, we've run stacks of processors on top of each other and everything else, and now we're getting down to the point where everything's getting too small and they're going to get into quantum effects because the microprocessors are too close to each other and the wires are too close to each other. So we have to figure out another way of doing things. And that's where we're going to break out into, you know, what are we going to start doing next? Where are we? No, this way. And I want to show this one, basically. This is from, from a Gartner. Gartner basically says, quantum computing spans all the technology spaces we have. These are from the emerging technology pieces. And we've talked about, you know, if you were 5G meeting, we talked about autonomous things. We talked about AI. We haven't talked about AI-driven stuff, but that's there too. Digital twins, immersive experience, blockchain. Quantum is going to surpass everything. It's going to be across the board for the technologies you're going to have to have. And it'll actually support most of those technologies, except for possibly blockchain. But the research is for the AI side, as well as most of the other ones, to tell us that quantum is going to be the supporting element that we're going to go forward with. And we'll get into some of these other ones. Right now, we're working on a draft strategy. Uh, it's in draft right now. We'll probably release it in a couple of weeks. And the strategy was built upon talking with the community that we started with. What things do we want to actually forward in, in, t in quantum? It was basically through sensing. Sensing is one area, communications, computing, material development, education. I'll get into each of those areas as to what we mean by that. But <clears throat> the goal basically for the strategy is provide near instantaneous sensing alternative decision development and secure activation of decisive actions and contentious multi-domain mission operations. That's a lot to say, <clears throat> but basically, it boils down to how fast can I make decisions <coughs> in a multi-domain operation, and how fast can I inf actually affect them. Okay. First objective. Objective in the strategy is for sensing. Developed capability to provide precise location and imaging data to detect enemy targets and navigation support for friendly aircraft. Some of the areas are really radar and imaging. This is something that's been going on for a while. That, that th the theory is that I can send quantum beams out and I can determine what comes back if I detect an object or not. I can also detect its size, I can detect its shape, I can detect everything about the object. So stealth goes away as a defensive mechanism. Because <clears throat> I'm not depending upon absorbing radar anymore. Quantum does not be absorbed, it detects, so it bounces back. And I can see the sense of the same thing at the same time. Same thing with uh, the uh, chemical, biological, radiation, nuclear explosive issues. How fast can I detect these things? So research is going into what quantum technologies can we actually do that? Navigation support is kind of interesting because we've tried to fix PNT for a while now. So the new philosophy is basically we're going to be able to show that uh, we can have quantum gyroscopes, accelerators, field detectors, and things. Based upon quantum being fast, I can determine where I am based on some other detector environments. So if I'm someplace over here and I can detect, I can determine how far away from something right away if I know that something exists. And so the philosophy is I can do this in a, in a really ma quick manner. I can do this so I can detect everything I need to do to determine where I am. This has been one of the keystones of some research has already been done on this. In fact, AFRL has done some of this already. So this is something that theoretically is where we can go right now if we had enough technology. <coughs> and I'm losing my voice again. <laughs> so hang in there. Communications, uh, quantum key distribution is a big deal. We've actually uh, talked to a startup company that is actually starting to do this on an electric grid right now. And we are trying to put them into the Small Business in Innovation Research Fund to actually do this for us, to do some more testing in our power grids, and they work with the Department of Energy. It basically says, keep generating random numbers and keys and keep absorbing them. And so if you detect an out of sequence issue, you will be able to detect that you have been attacked or somebody else has grabbed your information. Likewise, uh, 
do this at terrestrial. We believe that it can be done in between SATCOM and everything else in free space optics. And so the research is being done in that area as well right now. So we progress, this is one of the major areas we're going to go forward with. Computing. Computing is kind of interesting. Uh, the other two are pretty first specialized areas. Computing means general computing. And depends on the algorithm or the process you want. Now, usually you talk about two types of, of uh, machines. Uh, the general annealing architecture. And this is just because it's interesting because quantum computers are not like binaries. <coughs> They're not the same. When you talk about qubits across all the processors, all the computers that we have, everyone defines a qubit slightly differently, but also the same. For instance, uh, D-Wave has 1,000 qubits. IBM has 50. <laughs> they theoretically do the same thing. It's a question of how you put them together and how you manipulate them to get through any same result. The general annealing architecture is for optimization. Basically, it comes out to be a, if, if you like a topological map <laughs> that you input into the system and, sh and say, basically, show me the maximum or show me the minimum from the topological map. And so it's an optimization problem. The classic optimization problem everybody does, except that it could be instantaneously solved. Same with the, the, the gate architecture. The gate architecture looks like a computer processor, except it's, it's pews the the outputs through like gates to determine and or gates or whatever like electrical and comes out with a result at the end. And so you find the two different philosophies of how to do it. And for instance, the gate is, is like for uh, material science is being utilized right now as well as material development, determine the atomic structure of various things. So you see those architectures out there. So they're kind of like specializing, but they're all based upon the same problem space of how to look at a qubit and how to determine uh, all possible combinations of that qubit at the same time. And the, when you see these computers, and, I've got a, and I think that's the, uh, that's the IBM computer. <laughs> you don't see them like that. You see them in this, <coughs> this round case that looks like a round case. Looks like a water heater. <coughs> and the problem with the computer chip, which is really usually way at the bottom, is that most of the processing, most of the, of the case is used to cool it to near zero, near zero Kelvin. And you need to cool it all the time. And so most of it is just cooling capacity as opposed to anything else, as opposed to the actual chip. Chip sizes are, you know, like chip sizes, <laughs> real chip sizes. And so you think, you know, this little box, little thing is sitting there with wires attached to it. And you have this huge chamber above it, which is basically all the cooling that you need to do. It. And they usually cool in layers. They cool out and then keep on cooling down lower and lower until they get to the right temperature. And it's near zero degrees Kelvin, which is pretty cold. And, uh, but it's not zero degrees Kelvin. They found it doesn't work at zero degrees Kelvin. <laughs> it has to be like plus two. Dennis knew why. Also, there's a problem with uh, quantum error. Quantum, quantum error occurs because uh, it's hard to maintain the quantum state for a long period of time. And we're not talking like picking picoseconds, a long period of time. The, the reason is because there's outside influences. Anything that comes from the outside, cosmic particles, whatever, can affect the quantum. And so the way they have to do this, they have to push out. Uh, you'll see most of these computers are in are in very stable environments where there's no tremors, they're, they're encased, enclosed in various protective shielding, whatever, and that's basically the reason why, because they have to decrease the quantum error. And <coughs> research is being done to actually how many, how many qubits you need to actually decrease the cubic error is, is an issue. The other piece of this is that half of these, or all of them as far as we know, are connected to another computer because what happens is like for, for D-Wave, they generate a, you know, 30 billion instances in an instant. So they run, what, ha what happens is you, you perturb the environment, you run it again, you perturb the environment. This happens so fast that 30 billion instances roll out and you take the minimum or the maximum of those 30 billions. Because they're still trying to figure out how 
they can narrow it down to one instance coming out that is correct, the final real correct value. This can't do that yet because of the air quality that you get in when you start implementing it. So this is the way they get rid of some of the air in the system. Uh, obviously for ca capability, cryptography is a big deal. Uh, also to come with backwards, the quantum resistant encryption capability also. So we're looking at those two areas as well. Uh, material development. What you really want to do is, in this case, you want to model and replicate chemical reactions. And uh, this is where my deputy was really involved. She loves this. Uh, they can actually model, you know, uh, true chemicals into their energy states. And when you determine the energy state of the materials, you can affect understanding what the materials do, and you can change the energy state, which will affect the material. And so, like for instance, medical research. There's a lot of issues current with uh, protein folding. Uh, what you can do with this is you can actually unfold the proteins in the quantum state, and then you can determine what every possible projection of protein to drug combination you can have and do the effect. So it's a simulation of the result. And research is being done in that right now. To understand this is, this is a, the new technology, what you want to do with it. Education, of course you want to provide an environment for them to learn quantum effects and how should do programming. Programming is a little weird in these environments. <laughs> Let's just say that's, that's an understatement. The, uh, the IBM one, which is, you know, like two, if it's 2,000 cubics, expects a string of 2,000 ones and zeros. And basically what they're doing is they're laying out a topology map of what you think should go up and down in, in the equations. It's like a real optimization problem. Uh, the IBM one is totally different. <laughs> they, they're doing gates, and so they want to look like, a, like electrical structure or whatever, how you actually do this, and in OR gates and things like that, and some other combinations thereof. So what you get is two different models of how to program. Now they all want to come out with a single programming interface, <laughs> which is interesting, which I don't know if they can achieve that, but that's the end goal is an interface. But right now they're using all sorts of tools. Uh, some is MathLab. They, they've kind of used MathLab to actually come out with math problems and they automatically push it into the right format for the particular quantum computer. But they're also, uh, are are trying various other tool sets that actually support what they want to do, but this is something new. So programming is not like what you think programming is. Programming is totally different in this environment. And that's one of the, the drawbacks of this is because since it's totally different, you have to train people totally different to think about this. This is not your standard, you know, if then else clause issue. This is a, for chemistry, it's putting in the chemical equation in such a way that you can actually pull out the the, uh, the proton, photon, electronic capabilities and show that. This is very messy, but it does work. It does work to a certain degree, and they're getting much better at this right now. So we've, we've talked about, you know, providing opportunities for programming, in quotes, I should say, uh, using the EWE program and everything else to try to inject airmen into various uh, organizations that are currently trying to do uh, Computing, which is basically right now D-Wave, Rigotti, uh, IBM, as we go forward. And we also talk about developing a quantum education center, where we have liaisons to various quantum hubs as well as research institutes. So we're, that's all part of the strategy of how we're going to go forward with it. Uh, current efforts, which is what we're doing right now, uh, we're, we've established groups across, we've established a group across all the disciplines. We've been discussing quantum. Uh, we're going to have a face to face meeting again next month to try to iron out some of the difficulties and try to figure out how we're going to go forward with it. We're instrumenting, we're going to finish the, the quantum strategy. We have telecoms every other week with a little group. We want some other interesting people to join. What we're trying to do is we're trying to go forward. We now have developed, uh, or AFL is developing a relationship with IBM, and they'll have X number of hours of quantum computing capability as well as some resources for IBM. Uh, we've, we have a uh, small business 
innovation, be innovative beast. Yeah, can't talk. Innovative research grant with uh, Sibber, yes, with Rigotti, and we're going to have to them actually. Uh, we talked to them last Friday. Uh, they're going to give us oh x number of licenses to start using their computer as well. They're actually going to want us to. They want to train our people. They want to have real world problems. And they want, they want volunteers from you guys. <laughs> and this is something else we're going to have to get into. So if the issue is, you know, if you want to be involved in quantum computing, this is probably the time and place to start with. Uh, we're trying to develop, uh, we may actually go to the AI side. A, the AI uh, cross-functional team actually had a request out for problems to come in. And we got uh, almost 100 plus problems coming in. We may select some of those to go forward with, to say, maybe this should be some of the quantum research, because A, machine learning is one of the big things for Rigotti. Machine learning and optimization. Also mechanics, also materials. So it's a question of how you want to progress, and when everybody, we want to be able to show that it, it is applicable to real Air Force missions as opposed to just the theoretical basis. So really, we want participation from everybody. We really need it. We really need, if you have a good idea, if you have a problem that you believe needs to have a quantum computer or wants to be tried for a quantum computer, let us know because we really do want to do this. And it's, it's an important step in our evolution with the strategy and everything else we're trying to do. Because we are going to start pushing across of the rest of the Air Force. The AI cell, basically, we're uh, trying to coordinate this a little better from the headquarters side and so we are looking at you know, uh, the AI tasking as well and seeing how we can mesh the two together to some degree for some of the problem spaces. And as we get better and better, we'll figure out how we're going to actually allocate licenses for, for training for the IBM side and how we're going to actually do it for the Rigotti side. The Rigotti side wants, since it's a small business innovation, it's, there, it's going to be uh, a little bit different because uh, their end goal to get out of their cyber is to actually train us, give us training, actually do problem spaces with us and come out with some, res some results that make sense. IBM is just, here's my box, here's the computing capability, we're gonna give you some training and they would like to have the problem spaces. We'll probably have the same arrangement with D-Wave. D-Wave wants, I'll tell you, all of them want to have people work on their computers because they want to figure out the best way of programming their computers. So it's like crowdsourcing how do you compute a D in D way. In how we, it's like crowdsourcing how do you compute in a quantum computer is what it's really coming out to be. Because they're trying to find out the methods and which ones are best for which capabilities. And so that's why they want you know, our support and everybody else's. And we believe that we have to go forward with this pretty quickly because as as our technology is changing, and we find that our, uh, our enemies, let us say, are working well in this area, that we have to be able to catch up at least in a certain way, and we want to be able to grab whatever quantum computers we have and use them for the best possible missions that we have available. Okay, the, uh, we want to increase our working group. We, we really want people who are interested in this. This is going to take a lot of work from our side. It's not, it's not trivial to set up a new strategy, set up a new group, and start doing this. <laughs> so if you're interested, let us know, because we'll try to play in. I mean, we're using this Gmail, US Air Force CITO at gmail.com. So send in information and requests and whatever. Uh, if you want part of the quantum group, we can bring you into the quantum group. That's real easy. Uh, if you want to be part of the experimentation, let us know. <laughs> if you have any good ideas, and we really need some good ideas. So, because we don't, we want to make sure that the money we're investing in Rigotti, and it's not an insignificant fund because they're also getting public, they're also getting commercial support to do the job with us. <laughs> it's not the normal SIBRs, it's like three times the normal SIBR. So it is a lot of money that's being spent to support this. Towards effort. It's not Air Force money either. 
it's capital venture capital funds as well because they want to be able to actually sell the product. And so it's, that's what you see a lot is that uh, the product owners like to uh, spend some R&D money to support whatever they're doing. This is one of the ways they're doing it. And I think that's all I got. Before I lose my voice again. Yes, any questions? Problems? Queries? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> submit. <clears throat> Sorry, guys, I'm losing my voice today. Uh, submit your information to me, to us. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and talk to you. Uh, we have to get your commander to agree to it, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is always part of the, part of the hardest deal. <laughs> but, you know, enough emphasis we could put on it. We can, we'll tr try to figure that out. And it's a question of what, what do you want to do? I mean, being part of the group is interesting, but you know, our meetings are pretty short, basically trying to figure out when we're gonna meet with each other and then look at what research we're gonna start working on. That's, that's pretty much what the meetings are. If you wanna participate in actually doing the stuff, then it's more interesting. Then we get into more detailed conversations as to what we want to do and where you can do this and everything else associated with it. And as we progress with both you know, IBM and, and Rigotti, we'll progress this even, we'll get better, uh, process established of how we want to do this. Uh, we know that <clears throat> the requests for, as we get more requests in, we have to vet the request and determine if we have the capabilities to actually support it. And then as we get, we'll figure this out. But this is something we we're trying to do with the AI side as well, except a little bit farther with the AI side, because we had requests in to do AI that was gonna work with MIT. However, However, there's only, we can only have 10 projects work with MIT. And so we got 150 requests. So as we go through that, the same thing with this. This is gonna be the same thing, or we go back to the AI side and say, hey, what request do you have to, that may be compatible with quantum capabilities? Any other questions? Discussion, problems, how's your day been today? <laughs> I'm losing my voice, so you can know I'm hot days today. <laughs> yes? Are you looking for industries working with quantum communication to participate in your we can, have, we can have discussions about it, yes. I mean, we have a, we're trying to get a cyber with one already for the, quantum, for the quantum key management. We're looking for other people, too, that we would actually do some arrangement with, either a testing agreement, a, a crater, or maybe a cyber. Yes. Is there any KFSB that you're particularly looking for versus others? And if, if no. not, uh, what qualifications would you want someone volunteering? Okay, I'll tell you. My, my <clears throat> deputy would say, we want a chemist. <laughs> 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 so I don't think it's the qualification matters so much. I mean, the interest, because it's the wide enough field, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting because it's not programming. <laughs> that's, that's the key here. It's not just programming. It's something totally different, and that's why we need to have the education different than what you normally go to. And so the fields are open. I mean, we talk about, you know, I mean, chemistry is a big deal for this one, as well as con. But it's, you know, if you have an interest in it, it's more important now than anything else because of the because of the areas that you want to get into. Because we are learning about this. This is not a, this is not a trivial little endeavor that, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, AI is, ML is really code. It's, you know, Python code. You know, if you code it enough, you can code in Python. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I mean, not be good, but you can code in Python and come up with stuff. This is not that. <laughs> this is totally different. Anything else, anybody? Okay, nothing else. Thank you. Short presentation. <laughs>